This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Stick around to find out how you can get 85% off and three extra months for free. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and yet again another huge week of space news. The Starship SN5 has been pressured up this week with liquid nitrogen, getting ready for a static fire test quite soon, we hope. We've got a bunch of news and updates around the development of the space launch system. SpaceX had another incredible launch with the GPS-3 mission during the week, flawless yet again. A few updates on the Crew Dragon Demo 2 mission to share, and also we have our fingers crossed that the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover mission will get across the line before the end of the launch window to Mars after yet another delay in the schedule. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. The Starship SN5 vessel was the talk of the week when it comes to Starship updates. A little over a week ago, the vessel had been moved down to the launch site, but more recently testing had begun with the prototype performing a cryogenic pressure test Tuesday night. Considering the carnage left by the massive explosion of Starship serial number 4 just one month earlier, it was quite incredible to see SN5 on the new upgraded stand so quickly before being tested. Of course, in these tests, the Starship tanks are just filled with liquid nitrogen which is non-flammable so even if there is a rupture there is no chance for anything to combust. Now while the pressure test occurred SpaceX also simulated the force of the Raptor engine thrust by using the hydraulic rams to exert that force onto the thrust puck structure where eventually the engines will find their home. Now speaking of the hydraulic rams they were then removed shortly after in preparation of that engine installation. We're also wondering whether the nose cone that was moved around in the week is destined to be added to the SN5. I do believe that was the plan before the SN4 exploded, but we're still waiting to see some more conclusive evidence of that. We've also just seen a Raptor engine rolling down to the launch site. Say hello to Raptor SN27, which is currently in the process of installation. We are heading quite rapidly to the first static fire for Starship SN5, which should occur over the next week. Along with that, the largest crane that we have ever seen on site at Boca Chica has been coming together for a while while now. This is a huge beast and it's believed that its primary purpose, at least in the short term, is to help construct the new high bay building which will be high enough to contain a super heavy booster. I suspect as soon as we see a Starship prototype fly, the super heavy construction will be on the cards. I just can't wait to see this thing in action. If you think the Starship alone is huge, just wait until you see the super heavy booster that this will go on top of. Now I just want to share an awesome animation here made in Blender by Deep Space Courier of Starship Evolution from a prototype high altitude test flight transitioning all the way through to landing on Mars. This just gives a glimpse into what could be. To get hung up on any technical aspects here would miss the essence of what the animation creator is aiming at and I think that is just to share the excitement of what is happening and what is to come. That flip maneuver though, man that is going to be a sight for sure. I do wonder what the final name for this will be. The musk roll or the bath maneuver perhaps. What do you think this transition into landing could be called? Leave your comments below. I'd love to see your thoughts and I'm sure there will be plenty of laughs along the way. Some very fine animation work there and if you want to check out the full version of this go and check it out from the link in the description. There will be more to come I'm sure. While we're on the topic of shouting out incredible creations, Alex here created a beautiful remake of the Interplanetary Transport System video from 2016, but instead with the new version of the Starship modded out in Kerbal Space Program. For someone like myself that started a channel with KSP, I know just how huge an effort it is to create something like this. Absolutely awesome work there, Alex. There is a link to the video that includes all of the audio in the description below. I got the same chills as the original, so go and check that out and support Alex there with all of these SpaceX recreations here. Now if you want to know more about the process the SN5 will go through before a potential flight, I talk about that more in depth in this video. While you're here of course, please do consider subscribing and taking a second to tap that like button. There is loads more news coming with Crew Dragon and Starlink as well, and I'd love to share all that with you. 
Now, NASA recently uploaded some beautiful videos showing a range of interesting footage of the development of the space launch system. While developing the rocket just like SpaceX, NASA makes test articles and intentionally pushes them to breaking point to determine if the correct pressures and systems behave as they expect them to. We don't often see this stuff from NASA as they move just a little more slowly and methodically. It's also not publicized quite so thoroughly as SpaceX given that access is very much restricted, unlike down at Boca Chica, Texas. So yes, to complete a qualification round of testing for the liquid oxygen tank, NASA created a test article here which was identical to the tank that will form part of the SLS core stage. The tank itself was mounted into this colossal steel frame at this test stand at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Hydraulics were positioned along the tank to apply huge forces from all sides until the tank was breached. For this test, it was filled with water to simulate how the liquid oxygen would flow out out after a rupture. Not quite as dramatic maybe as liquid nitrogen, but impressive all the same. As it happened, the tank ruptured within 2% of the modelled failure point, and this is going to provide a lot of handy information to assist the designers in making the tanks lighter in the future. I think it's also worth sharing this great footage of the earlier development of the core stage. A very cool montage here and a testament to how the teams have built out, rearranged and moved the core components of the space launch system rocket during its time in the Michoud assembly facility. Whether you're a fan of the Artemis program and the SLS or not, you just have to marvel at the immense technology at work here. What we are seeing here is the assembly of that massive core stage along with the hugely complex and expensive quad setup of the RS-25 engines. The entire development has been a hugely collaborative process for NASA as it normally is, including Boeing who are the core stage lead contractors and Aerojet Rocketdyne of course, handling those amazing engines. The core stage here is massive. The 65 metre or 212 foot tall core stage is the largest stage that has ever been built by NASA. In comparison, the S1C stage or first stage of the colossal Saturn V rocket was much shorter at 42 metres or 138 feet. Combine this with the twin solid rocket boosters which just by themselves have almost as much thrust as this. Yes, the five F1 engines of the Saturn V. The two together will have a combined 32,000 kilonewtons of thrust, just 1,000 kilonewtons less than the first stage of the Saturn V. Add to that the four RS-25s outputting roughly 7,450 kilonewtons of thrust for a total of near 40,000 kilonewtons, and this is going to be incredible to see take off. Now I know that people dislike the fact that this is a near fully expendable vehicle, but I really want to see this colossal beast fly. I mean they've come this far, they may as well finish it off right. It's worth noting that the super heavy booster with 31 Raptor engines will have roughly 72,000 kilonewtons. So that thing is beyond crazy. Now that SLS core stage is still completing a series of green run tests and I believe that it's just completed the second out of eight tests at Stennis Space Center. That was a test of the flight computers and avionics for the Artemis 1 mission. They brought the whole system to life and tested it out completely successfully. That system essentially controls the rocket's first eight minutes of flight, so great news there. On to the next test. Now what do you think? Are you looking forward to seeing the SLS take off at some point? Let me know in the comments below. Along with SLS development, it's been interesting to watch the progress of the massive 10 story tall logo that is plastered on the side of NASA's massive vehicle assembly building. The meatball has been getting a refreshing new coat of paint and it's looking much better. It was getting quite faded since it was last updated around 13 years ago. Really the facility hasn't been seeing a lot of action since the last flight of the shuttle in 2011, so there hasn't really been a great deal of reason to refresh it since then. Of course, after the beautiful Crew Dragon Demo 2 launch and as astronaut launches pick up and resume in increasing intensity, it was certainly time for some upgrades. As we return to landing crew on the moon and possibly further over the next decade, it's a great time for a revamp of the logo and the American flag here. Now speaking of the Crew Dragon, I've just got to share the amazing photograph taken by Chris Cassidy around the time of the spacewalk mission a little over a week ago. With this shot of the International Space Station's forward segment, we can clearly see SpaceX's Crew Dragon vehicle docked right there at the Harmony Module's International Docking Adapter. As we zoom in there, we can see a lot of interesting detail there. Amazingly high quality photos too. In this shot here, while on the spacewalk, we can see Bob Benkin working hard.
hard there, swapping out batteries and upgrading power systems there at the station's starboard six truss structure. Here in the top right is an external pallet gripped by the cannon arm too. That had the batteries loaded onto it. Now both Bob and Chris were out there for a little over six hours and they did an amazing job. Incredible work guys. This week's launch of Falcon 9 saw a brand new booster designated B1060, which was used to help deliver another payload to orbit. The fairing halves for this mission were also brand new with a planned scoop recovery as opposed to a catch with the nets. This was ultimately successful with both halves being retrieved as we spotted returning via these shots here from booster buddies. Nice work there, Matt. So yes, the GPS-3 vessel is manufactured by Lockheed Martin, and it's the latest operational addition to the current GPS constellation. With enhanced design capabilities, this latest addition will provide a lot of great advancements for civilian and military users. Now, these GPS-3 satellites have three times better accuracy and up to eight times improved anti-jamming capabilities than older version GPS satellites, and this is the third to be launched. The Falcon 9, of course, launched the first back in December 2018, and United Launch Alliance launched the second in August of 2019. Now, interestingly, the first Falcon 9 launch didn't attempt a drone ship landing. The customer in this case was unsure if the margins would be adequate and essentially they wanted more room to move. For this mission, they worked through the numbers and SpaceX made them confident that they could deliver and still recover the booster. And due to the very high elliptical orbit needed for these missions, they need every bit of performance that they can get. The fact that SpaceX again recovered the booster is a testament to how accurate and reliable the Falcon 9 is, and what amazing pieces of technology these new satellites are. We'll all benefit from these GPS upgrades over time. Now, there was an interesting mention here about the second stage prior to launch. It's painted grey to allow absorption of additional heat from the sun in order to help the fuel tank maintain its optimum temperature for the mission. The launch once again went perfectly with a successful parking orbit insertion announced just a few seconds before we saw the successful recovery of the new first stage booster on the drone ship. Just read the instructions here. The satellite itself was destined for a medium Earth orbit approximately 20,200 kilometers or 12,500 miles in altitude. There was some significant cruise time as part of the first coast phase at just over one hour after launch before the second ignition of that stage two engine south of Australia. The ground base station in Tasmania, which is where I'm from, was also feeding data to SpaceX at this point. And actually, just as a quick question here, would you guys like to see a future episode show Showing this tracking facility perhaps. I'm curious to know how many people would find that interesting. Let me know below. So yes, with a burn time of approximately 44 additional seconds, adding in excess of 2,000 meters per second additional velocity, engine shutdown left the payload hurtling along at over 33,800 kilometers per hour, or just over 21,000 miles per hour. With successful insertion into a transfer orbit, the vessel went into a second coast phase. After almost one and a half hours into the mission, we saw a successful deployment of the GPS-3 satellite, and what a wonderful sight there. This never gets old. Now, a little concerning news this week about another potential delay to the Mars 2020 mission. This is scheduled to launch the Mars Perseverance rover and the little helicopter Ingenuity a little later in the planned launch window. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but just quickly, this video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN, who have been huge supporters of my channel. Now, a VPN or a virtual private network allows you the potential to truly open up the internet. Have you chewed through all of the available content that you want to watch from libraries with within the country? Well, with Surfshark VPN, you can quite literally open up a world of new content to digest from around the globe previously locked to you. Simply change which country you're accessing the internet from, and just like that, you now appear to be browsing from that location and have access to new libraries to digest. This also allows access to social platforms and external news services that have perhaps been restricted from you. With your IP address, your behavior is tracked for marketing purposes all over the internet. Have you ever wondered why you're seeing an ad for a product that you looked at the week before. With Surfshark VPN, along with the clean web feature, you can mask that activity and surf protected while blocking ads and trackers as well. The internet should be a log-free open hub of knowledge, and by using Surfshark VPN, you can take control of your online security and visibility. You can protect yourself from data mining services, internet service providers, or even perhaps from those around you who may have very 
differing personal views or beliefs. Not only that, they are the only VPN service to offer one account to use on an unlimited number of devices. If you would like to support my channel and are also considering a VPN or even changing your existing VPN, go to surfshark.deals slash Marcus and you will get 85% off and three extra months for free. With a 30 day money back guarantee, you can try it out yourself hassle free. The link is in the description below. So yes, previously the Mars 2020 mission has already been pushed back several times and until this announcement on June 30th by NASA, the mission was scheduled to launch on the 22nd of July. Now it's just been delayed due to abnormal data found from a liquid oxygen sensor when they conducted the wet dress rehearsal of the launch vehicle, that of course being United Launch Alliance's Atlas V. As announced this time, the launch has been rescheduled no earlier than July 30th. Now that's starting to get a little concerning now because the end of the launch window to Mars for 2020 was August 11th, only 12 days from that new launch target. Luckily, NASA recently said that the window could be extended up until August 15th, adding another four days of launch opportunity. But even still, that is only 16 days left until the end of a possible launch. NASA officials do still say that they are confident that the launch will occur prior to this window closure and we've heard already that the Atlas V issues have been addressed but if it gets delayed for other reasons and doesn't make it that is going to mean we'll be waiting another 26 months for another chance to launch for Mars. As NASA's administrator Jim Bridenstine has already stated a delay like that could cost up to 500 million dollars so let's just keep our fingers crossed that we don't see any more delays creep in over this next month. Now a huge thank you to my amazing patrons here, I simply could not do what I'm doing here without you. Your generous support has allowed me to increase the time I can spend on this content and I can't thank you enough for that. Further help just allows me to do even more. If you like what I do and would like to join our awesome patrons here, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. You can interact with me more directly via the included roles in Discord, you can check out some exclusive patron only content and you can also have your name listed right here like these other incredible people. I thank them of course, but just as importantly, you for your support. Because of you watching and interacting with these videos, I can keep on creating so that we can watch and analyze the progress towards achievements that will take us beyond the atmosphere to live far from where we've evolved. A massive thank you as well to my Quality Control Squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and you would like to be part of this, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today we have my video last week talking about these new Starlink user terminal prototypes. In the top right is my latest video and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you all in the next video.